Hey guys, today's video is going to be on Starlink's forces. We're going to do some basic science review and then a lot of clinical correlates to what's going on here so that you can apply them on the wards and learn more about fluid dynamics. So here we have a capillary and we have hydrostatic and oncotic pressures which control fluid movement in this capillary. Now this applies to the small vessels in your body, your capillaries, your venules, okay? so. We have two forces controlling fluid movement, whether it goes out from the capillary into the interstitial space where our cells are, or whether it goes back inside the capillary and continues flowing through the circulation to the heart or out to the tissues. And our two forces here are hydrostatic and oncotic. So P will represent our hydrostatic and pi will represent our oncotic. Now hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of fluid inside a vessel. So if you have a lot of fluid inside of a vessel, it's going to want to go outside. And because our capillary is full of flowing fluid and it needs that higher pressure to maintain circulation, our PC is going to be greater than our PI. Our interstitium doesn't have really much hydrostatic pressure compared to our capillaries. Next, we have our pi C and our pi I. These represent our oncotic pressures and they essentially represent solute concentrations in the area. So solutes are small molecules. They're glucose, they're protein, things like that. They're going to draw water towards them. Solutes draw in solvent. So because our capillary has a higher solute concentration than our interstitial space, let's put a couple dots here. The net movement of water is going to be into our capillaries. Okay. So now we see that our hydrostatic pressure is looking to push fluid out. And because we don't want to collapse our capillaries or our vascular system, we're going to take this fluid and we're going to move at least a part of it back inside to not collapse them with our oncotic pressure. So we're looking here at the net. The net hydrostatic moves fluid out and the net oncotic pulls fluid back in. And that's what our equation here is showing. We can really ignore these coefficients. They are just net values between hydrostatic and oncotic. And if hydrostatic wins out, we have a positive JV, which is going to show us that fluid is moving net outwards because our P is winning. And if net oncotic wins out, then we have fluid moving back in. So you'll notice here that this kind of really explains how capillaries and veins move fluid from tissues. So capillaries are high pressure systems. They're arterial systems, so they're higher pressure. And they're going to win out with the hydrostatic pressures because they have higher pressures within them to push fluid out. And then when you get to, a, a, let's say, a venule, the pressures are a lot lower, the, the vein pressures are lower. And what veins are responsible for is taking all that fluid and pushing it back to the heart, back to the lungs to get reoxygenated, and then back to the arterial system to get a bunch more nutrients so that our tissues can get nourished. So in our veins, our oncotic pressure is going to win out, pull fluid back in, and then move it back to the heart. So that's just a quick physiology explanation, and then our JV will be negative in that case. So the kidney is one of the areas where our starling forces really shine and they can explain a lot of things. For example, our GFR is essentially a starling equation. If we look at the hydrostatic pressures here, PC and PB, our C is our capillary hydrostatic pressure, PB is our Bowman's hydrostatic pressure and they're fighting each other and um, glomerular hydrostatic pressure wins out and pushes fluid into the Bowman space to eventually create urine and cause excretion of um, filtrates in the kidney. And then we have our pi C, which is our glomerular hydrostatic pressure, our oncotic pressure, and that's gonna pull fluid back in because if we push too much out from our glomerulus, we're gonna co essentially collapse our efferent arterial. There's not gonna be enough fluid in there. So hydrostatic and oncotic pressures are balancing each other out here. Now you'll notice that there is no pi B or a oncotic Bowman space pressure because the amount of solute that's really uh, coming out into the Bowman space is so much less or really insignificant. If you have a lot of solute in the Bowman space, uh, that's going to be in cases like people with diabetes with glucose in their urine. It's going to be pulling a lot of the fluid out. And so those kinds of patients you really need, really need to watch out for excess fluid excretion because now in that case we would have a pi B and it would be drawing fluid in and pushing a lot of uh, increased GFR. So let's talk about uh, ACE inhibitors and then we'll cover, we'll come back to diabetes. So when you have a high fluid pressure inside your body, your glomerulus is gonna sense that. So the JG cells in your glomerular apparatus will secrete renin. 
Brennan is an enzyme, so it's going to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 is going to circulate through the blood to the lungs, where ACE is another enzyme there. It's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Then because your circulation comes back to the kidney, uh, ACE, angiotensin 2 is going to come and constrict the efferent arterial and say, hey, we have too much fluid, our blood pressure is too high, we need to push out more fluid through our glomerular capillary. So now all of this fluid is going to contribute to our hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, and it's going to push more fluid out. So you're going to pee more, reduce the pressure in your total system. Now, when we have an ACE inhibitor, one of the key clinical correlates here is that ACE can do something like bump your creatinine. So we all know that creatinine is an estimate for, creatinine clearance at least, is an estimate for glomerular filtration rate because creatinine is one of those molecules that is not really reabsorbed and not really excreted. I mean, it is a little bit excreted, so inulin would be better, but it's a lot more convenient because you don't have to inject it. So when you have someone with um, uh, ACE inhibitor on them, so they're, they're taking the ACE inhibitor, that ACE enzyme is going to be inhibited, so now we don't have angiotensin 2, right? And that's not going to constrict our efferent, so our efferent is going to dilate and allow more of the fluid to come out. So let's just clear up this diagram for a second. More fluid is coming out this end, so our hydrostatic pressure is going to be decreased, right? And because our hydrostatic pressure is decreased, our creatinine isn't cleared as much, so it's not pushed out as much into the Bowman space, and it's going to stay inside the circulation more. So your creatinine is expected to be bumped up a little bit. Now, a, a very important thing to think about is if you have someone with bilateral renal artery stenosis, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated. So if we block flow here and then we open up flow on the back end in the efferent arterial, our glomerular capillary has no fluid in it. So our hydrostatic pressure goes essentially to something too low. And now we have no GFR and our filtration system is not working. So you can really mess up the kidneys by giving an ACE inhibitor to someone with bilateral renal artery stenosis. So expect a mild bump in creatinine if you give an ACE to anyone, um, but if it, the creatinine jumps really high, then you have to be concerned for bilateral renal artery stenosis. Another thing here is um, that we have the efferent arterial affected by diabetes. So when you have someone with diabetes, they have a lot of glucose in their blood. And a lot of that glucose uh, is retained in the capillary because you don't want to pee it out. You would have too much fluid coming out at that point. So people with uh, early onset diabetes, so their first few years of diabetes, will have glucose building up in their efferent arterial. And how it does that is it creates advanced glycated end products or ages, and they damage the endothelial wall of the efferent arterial. Now, when we damage the efferent arterial, we get a uh, constriction because it's no longer keeping its proper shape. Now, that constriction causes fluid to build up and uh, our hydrostatic pressure in our glomerulus is going up again. When that happens, we have an increased GFR. Now, wouldn't you say, hey, that's, that's a good thing. Our GFR is staying high. Our patient is better off because they're, they have a good GFR. I know diabetics usually have a poor GFR. Now, this is the same principle as in hypertension. Hypertension, sure, you have higher pressures, and that contributes to in, in, increased circulation for some time, but what happens is that high pressure will damage this unit in the long run. So we want to limit that high pressure by doing what? So we have our constricted efferent, and what dilates the efferent? That's right, ACE inhibitors. So, uh, ACE inhibitors are renal protective. They pr protect them from glomerular capillary hypertension. So ACE inhibitors, that's why they're recommended for diabetics. And so we have now talked about the kidney. We've talked about a little bit of the basic science of flow in the body. Let's just go back and talk about calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers dilate your arterioles. And since we're on the topic of ACE, what's one of the uh, key side effects of a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker? Well, that's peripheral edema. When you dilate the peripheral capillaries, you're going to have uh, increased hydrostatic pressure, and then that hydrostatic pressure is going to put fluid in your interstitial space. Now, when we have 
too much fluid in our interstitial space, we have edema, and that's uncomfortable for the patient, and they get too much fluid buildup. They get a lot of swelling, especially in the legs. To counteract this, we can give them an ACE inhibitor. Now, how does that work? An ACE inhibitor, what it's going to do is it's going to dilate the post-capillary venules, just like it dilated here, kind of the post-capillary arterial. Anything post-capillary is sort of dilated by ACE. And when the post-capillary venules are dilated, it helps drain the fluid out from the interstitial space, and you're going to counteract that peripheral edema side effect. Now, if we go to the lungs, let's quickly talk about some well, lung correlates for starling forces. Here we have our interstitial space. Here we have our capillary again. Now, a lot of problems happen in the lungs if your interstitial space is filled with fluid because the space between the alveolus and the capillary matters a lot. The thicker this space is, the more fluid is in here, the harder oxygen and CO2 have, um, they have a hard time diffusing through. So we want to keep this interstitial fluid to a minimum. Now, in people who have lung infections with a virus or a bacteria, the capillaries become uh, leaky through um, different cytokines, bradykinin, histamine, things like that, they cause leaky capillaries, and that fluid, because of the high hydrostatic pressure, is going to move out into the interstitial space and cause uh, edema. And when you have that edema, it's called uh, ARDS. So the ARDS symptom can be alleviated by having someone on like a steroid, because the steroid is going to reduce the inflammation and allow for good circulation throughout the lungs. So poor circulation with leaky capillaries causes poor diffusion, and then if you can't breathe, you can't get oxygen, your electron transport chain doesn't work, and your cells start to die off. An, an interesting thing here is, what if we're thinking, hey, we don't know, this, this person's lungs are filled with fluid, but could it be from the heart? Because if you know that if the heart's not working, if, if there's fluid backup from the heart, it could be backing up into the lungs, increasing the hydrostatic pressure again, and pushing that fluid out. So is it an infection that's doing this? Is it heart failure that's doing this? Now, sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell. And one of the things, one of the key values you use there is the left arterial pressure. It's also sometimes called um, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. If that's less than 18, you know that it's non-cardiogenic. Just a very uh, important fun fact there. Then we have things like uh, our oncotic pressure, which we've been ignoring. So we've talked about hydrostatic pressure over and over again. Now let's review oncotic pressures because it's important. So diseases where you lose protein from your body are going to contribute to a loss of oncotic pressure and again, edema because oncotic pressure is going to keep our um, fluid inside of our blood vessels, not in the periphery. So things like nephrotic syndrome, where you're peeing out albumin, you lose the oncotic pressure. If you lose it enough, you progress to something called anasarca, which is essentially really severe edema. Then we have Menetriere's disease. This is a GI protein losing disease, where you have a mucosal membrane overgrowth. That, that way your um, proteins aren't being properly reabsorbed in your GI system. You're losing a lot of protein and you get peripheral edema because again, your pi C or your oncotic pressure in your capillaries is too low. You don't have enough protein there. And then the last one, which everybody I'm sure has heard about is Quashure core. This is a protein malnutrition disease where you don't consume enough protein and therefore your oncotic pressure goes down because you don't have enough in your system. So those, those kids uh, with Quashure core, they, they classically have very large bellies. That's because their mesenteric vessels are um, don't have enough protein in them, so it's going to leak into their, their interstitial space of their mesentery, which is their stomach area, and they're going to have fluid buildup there. And another important thing to be careful for these Quashuacro kids is because they have so much fluid now there, it's a great place for bacteria to grow, so they can get spontaneous bacterial peritonitis as a result. So I hope you guys enjoyed this quick review on Starling Forces. I hope it was helpful for a clinical review, just for general knowledge, and I'll see you in the next one.